Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue. Our next keynote presenter is Veronica Casey. Uh, you can also use pigeonhole for this session. Veronica has held uh, diverse positions over the last 35 years as a registered nurse and uh, midwife covering clinical leadership roles, quality management and change management positions. In the last 17 years, Veronica has held executive leadership roles within Queensland Health and since 2006 has served as the Executive Director of Nursing and Midwifery Services for the Metro South Hospital and Healthcare Services. Please uh, join me in welcoming Veronica as uh, she talks about advancing nursing leadership trials, tribulations and transformations. Thanks, everybody. I've just got to get myself organised, right eyes on, and then uh, I'll be ready to go. Now, how wonderful. Um, Alan, thank you so much. Uh, that was truly amazing and inspiring, so thank you. But it's also part of my talk. <laughs> so that's good, and hopefully mine will be uh, somewhat practical in terms of um, some uh, examples. Now, the other thing I do know, and I can see, because of the lights, I can't see everyone, but I um, know a number of my colleagues from Metro South are here, and they are truly some of the most inspiring leaders that I've ever worked with. So can you put your hands up so you can show everybody that you're great leaders? And these are the people that you're looking around. I know you're all great leaders, but I haven't met all of you yet. Um, these are the people that make me look good every day. So I have the best job. <laughs> and the best leadership role that I think anyone could ever have. So thanks, team, and um, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to work with you, um, and you do. You inspire me every day, so thank you. So um, we're going to talk about advancing nursing leadership. What a great topic, and I'm glad that everybody um, wants to be here to learn about it. And, Alan, I think... Um, Every time uh, speakers talk about this, there'll be a, a unique perspective, but there'll be a lot of similar thoughts. Um, but what is really important in these sessions is to really use that time for reflection on your own thoughts and experiences and the learnings from that. So um, today I'm going to go through um, some areas and really talk about um, Princess Alexandra, which is a large tertiary uh, hospital, which is sort of just down the road. And I'm always geographically challenged, I think it's that way, um, but you can walk. Um, we're just going to have that as a bit of an example from the magnet journey, so to pull some of the concepts together. Um, but you'll be able to use the actual uh, learnings from that in any setting and in any sort of framework that you would like to use. So we know we've just heard and our speakers have talked about nursing's the most trusted um, profession. It's you know, seen as the most trusted, ethical and honest profession and has remained so over the years, uh, despite uh, what I call things going bump in the night. And we are in an extremely privileged position um, and to actually know and understand what patients, our community um, and the requirements of the organisation are. But it's interesting, I think sometimes we take that for granted and sometimes we don't use that as some of um, our unique power that we could use as well or take advantage of some opportunities that could come. Uh, we've talked about mid-staff and um, I was interested when Alan said, you know, it could be any, all of us, I wouldn't think there'd be anybody in this room that over time has not sort of thought uh, there could any of us go but the grace of God. And I use some other experiences too because um, uh, in Australia we actually have had what I'd call again speed bumps on the road to heaven in terms of uh, Bundaberg in the Foster Review, Melbourne Inquiry, King Edward, Royal Melbourne. And the common themes that without going through any of these um, or all of them is about the culture, is about leadership, is about education and it is about the focus on the patient. And, and multiple disciplinary teams coming together. And I, I've actually um, had the, I don't know if it's the privilege, but because I sort of do a bit of teaching here and there, um, and this is one of the areas, if you actually read the whole um, scripts and, and you know, um, outcomes, they are incredibly simple, what appear simple themes, but very highly complex and very difficult to overcome. So, um, and I, I must admit, I was only thinking the other day, I've, I'm actually on annual leave at the moment, and I don't know what I was thinking about this, I was cleaning up, but um, I was thinking about where I was and what I was doing when the news of Bundaberg came through. And um, I was actually working in a residential care setting uh, down by the Bayside um, in Brisbane, and I remember saying to one of my colleagues then, 
that could be any of us uh, because of various um, attitudes, uh, lack of respect, or it could be that you know the leadership or the metrics aren't reflecting what has said. There's a subculture, and I said, and I remember uh, talking about how do you make sure that you know what's going on. But anyway, so we'll, preventable harm. You know, over the last 20 years, uh, a lot of work has been uh, look, being looked at in terms of how do we improve our safety and quality for our patient care. Um, I'm sure many of you have read to Err is Human. It's one of the sentinel pieces of work from the US, from the Institute of Medicine. Um, similar things happening in Europe and Australia. We're all sort of looking around the same, how, how, do we, how do we make a difference to the patients and communities that we serve? Um, I think the one for me, and I'm sure you'll all run home and, and read it tonight, but is the 2013 um, IOM report for nursing. And it's really um, about that leadership, calling nurse leaders to action. Now, this is certainly US-centric at this point, but if you read it, take the filters off of the US, you can actually put your filters on there and say, that's about me. That's about me as a nurse leader. That might be about uh, where I work. It could be around how um, we do business and about how sometimes we are passive in that um, leadership role. And I thought that the response that Alan gave in terms of, you know, how do we have a voice, what makes that unique contribution to profession and practice at all levels of the organisation, particularly at the executive and board level, it's critically important. And I think sometimes um, it's our of inability to articulate what that is. And so if there's one thing you take away from these um, like yesterday, today and tomorrow, have, have a, um, a really strong filter on what it is that you, the individual, and as a, as a nurse leader, doesn't matter what you're doing, you're a nurse leader, how you contribute to that. And what's your expectation of your nurse leaders? It might be in more senior roles. Um, what your expectation of them is as well and make that known. So I think there's multiple, um, uh, there's a lot of written work uh, around, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of uh, reflections, and there's a lot of experts out there. But you know what? What we have to do is just go on the journey and actually do something. So culture is, I think, um, as I'm sure many speakers have said, is the underpinning, uh, I don't want to call it a success factor, but it's what makes things happen. It is the soul of the organisation. And um, we know to transform culture is to ensure that we actually meet those patient outcomes, that we actually have pride in our profession and practice, and that we know we're doing the best thing. And it should be the central focus of everything we do, is having a positive workplace culture, because of course um, culture is a thing. It, it, it is um, something that can be negative or positive. So we want a, a positive workforce, uh, workplace culture. So in this, um, with all the theories and, and the practices around, the journey is really, really important. And I think that um, being a leader in transforming culture is around that quality of the shared governance models that we have in place. It's actually understanding the change processes we go through and being prepared to lead that change. Sometimes you don't even know where that change is truly going. It's actually about um, not just supporting the staff, but actually valuing every unique contribution that the workforce makes. And I do want to make, I know this is, we're talking about nursing leadership, but this is always in the context, depending on our, where we're working and what we're doing and what our roles are or what our leadership is. This is always also about a patient focus or a, or a consumer or the group, but it's also about the interdisciplinary team and that unique contribution that nursing makes. So it is about um, I always think about keeping things as simple as they can possibly be um, and actually doing something differently. It's uh, always that uh, saying, isn't it? You can't keep doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. So I want to talk a little bit about a wonderful um, nurse leader, and I think many of you in the room would know Mrs Joy Vickerstaff. Joy Vickerstaff, who was, has worked in many areas within um, Australia as a, a very... Um, respected and I think nearly unique nurse leader at the time. Joy has uh, been retired now for some time, but she actually um, started at Princess Alexandra Hospital 1999. And um, I think it's worth just having a couple of minutes on this story because 
You know how I said, there go us but the grace of God and any of those things that might happen. I'm going to be, um, and I know my colleagues will be fine with this, but uh, Princess Alexandra was in a bit of a uh, poor state at that time. It's just a cycle of life where your organisations go through. So Joy enters as the Executive Director of Nursing, very experienced uh, senior nurse leader, to very poor nurse indicators and poor patient outcomes from, as resulting from nursing practice poor culture and disengagement. Just to give you a couple of metrics, the data in terms of the turnover rate at the time for nursing was um, around 28%. That's a over a quarter of your workforce. So that's not placing the patients in the best area. Vacancy rates at about 12% always. Um, record agency use and bed closures because of nursing. Now that's not because saving dollars or anything like that, it was because of nursing. So that's a long time ago. So Joy tells a wonderful story, and some of you have heard it before, but um, she had a vision, and she had a moment in the, in the um, night, about two o'clock, because she had been with her nurse executive, and some of them are here today, and they can tell this story better, but that they really were struggling what to do. How, how do we turn this around? This has been like this for a while. And so she had remembered the research that had been done in the US in... About the, it was about 1983, uh, and in fact it was about uh, workforce uh, recruitment, retention and turnover. And um, so that, uh, some of us who are of my vintage, so there mightn't be many of you, I remember studying it for a whole semester at university when I went into the tertiary sector when we first started to go into universities. And so the what was called the magnet research. And so out of that, to cut a long story short, a model and a framework became a program so that organisations could use a nursing framework that was evidence-based to improve not only workforce indicators, but obviously if you have good workforce, um, you know, if recruitment and retention and if that's low and you've got ongoing and continuity of care, you get better patient outcomes. And it's about the culture of the organisation. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Princess Alexandra is still on its magnet journey. Uh, we are now have three redesignations, which I'm very pleased to say. We use the framework as the essence of our the way that we actually do business within nursing, given it's within the multidisciplinary team and the organisation. And um, transformational leadership, if I can just say, the framework now has the five components, um, and it used to have 14 forces, and that they sit within those components. And it is critical that the transformational leadership is something that it occurs at all levels. And um, that is something that if people uh, come into our whole health service, yeah, nurses, it is an expectation from if you're a new grad, if you're a student, to the executive director of nursing, that is an expectation that you take an, an ongoing and active leadership role. Um, and with that comes responsibilities and, and outcomes. But it's exciting, it's energising, it's wonderful. So um, just so that you know that if you've got a strong, passionate and supportive leaders at all level, you end up um, getting and developing excellent structures. And when I talk about structures, I'm talking about that, you know, you do need some structure around what you do, and that's both uh, um, in terms of policies, procedures, organisational, you know, communication, governance, all of that. But it's about also the shared governance structures that we have. Um, we also then... That leads to outstanding practice, and that's what we do. That's what we're absolutely wanting to do. The end point of nursing is outstanding practice, no matter what your role is and what function you have. And then, of course, you have exceptional outcomes, and that's what you strive for. And um, I know that uh, for those who know me, I have a bit of a reputation that I'm a bit... Um, no, I don't think I'm actually um, competitive, really. Um, it's just that... <laughs> I, I do believe if it was our um, relative, our patient, our loved one, our community member, people deserve the best possible care they can get. And that's what we would expect for ourselves and our loved ones, so that we should be the best we can be. It doesn't matter who you are, what your role is, that's what has to happen. But we've got to make that happen as well together, so, you know, in an organisation. So transformational leadership has been, I have to say, for me, it is the most important component. Um, because if you don't have that, 
the other doesn't naturally flow and you don't get the, well, I don't believe you have the outcomes. So there's been a lot of work and we've seen with our previous speaker, you know, leadership, there's a lot of research, but some of the core um, and the essence of it is very much around um, modelling the way, I mean, we've got the list up there, there's, there's no, no surprises for people, but it's actually hard to action. But I do believe that it's about inspiring that um, shared vision. And that's not about me or somebody else getting up and saying, this is what we're going to do. Well, occasionally I do do that. But it's about then winning the hearts and minds of people to come with you on the journey. But the other thing is often, and I have to say probably 99.5% of the time, people have a lot better ideas and vision than I have. And I think it's about um, that wonderful challenge of that status quo, the possibilities that can happen. It's about others being able to do what they need to do and sharing and inspiring others. And it becomes quite infectious. And it's actually um, recognising that value that every single person contributes to the outcome. I think it's really important. Um, the American Nurses Credentialing Centre actually uh, are the, if I can put the owners or have the magnet um, recognition program, it is a formal uh, credential. But I have to say that um, transformational leadership is interesting because I think in the past, and if you're, as I say, my vintage and been around a while, I think that um, we've learnt many leadership models and they've all contributed significantly to a body of knowledge and they all assist in, in getting outcomes. But what I love about um, the definitions that are used for transformational leadership in this particular program is that it's the role modelling for the followers. It's the exhibiting high levels of the ethical behaviour and instilling pride and gaining respect and trust. It's not about your position or power at all. It's about the inspirational motivation that happens and articulating that vision that appeals to people or that they can improve upon. It's setting the highest standards because, uh, and I loved what was said before, if you do not set high standards, you aspire just to be good. Is good good enough? Never. It is never good enough. You have to be the best you can be and you have to strive to be better. And unless you do that, um, things become very ordinary. And that is never good enough for patient outcomes or nursing practice or nursing leadership. The other thing is we need to be intellectual about it. Um, challenge assumptions, take risks, um, in be innovative, reframe the problems and issues. Um, uh, somebody just said to me before, and she can probably see me, I can't see her at the moment, but um, it's like, come to my office, don't, don't bring a problem, I want the solutions and I want multiple of them, and you'll get a job anyway, so if you haven't come with it, you'll go away for it. But it's not about that, it's about having that confidence it's that confidence to go and say, I really don't know what the answer is, but we should be looking here, or we should be looking there, or we should be doing whatever. Um, but the other thing is the individualised considerations are important. It's like to, to acknowledge the greatness of every single person who contributes to a change or to leadership and to create a culture is really important. We need to invest and coach and build empathy and support at all levels of the organisation, give people the skills um, and, and nurses coming through and our colleagues that we actually respect and celebrate the contribution of individuals and teams. And I think that's important. Sometimes nurses... Uh, for me, my observation would be, and I could be wrong, but we're so busy, busy being busy and doing and on to the next thing because we want to solve the problem that we must take time to reflect, we must take time to celebrate that contribution and we must actually, um, I'm just looking at Elaine down here, you know, we don't publish. I was only thinking about, I've, had, I've spent a lot of time on planes lately and I was thinking around, you know, there are great things happening, there are great stories, there's great research and I don't think as nurses we actually capture that. We don't share it enough. And in fact, we say, oh, well, who'd want to know that? And I, I'm the same. But um, anyway, I, I do think this is an area that we could improve. But in summary, I think um, for the first time many years ago, I met a, a professor of nursing called Gail Wolf, and she's actually quite renowned, a US um, leader. And um, I loved her definition of uh, transformational leadership. She actually said to me, Veronica, 
when it all comes to the end of it, you take people where they don't think they want to go, but at the end they really believe that they want to be there and they take it further. And I thought, OK, I can do this. And also, if you read the, her articles, they're exceptional, but she said that's the summary and I like the summary piece. Anyway, so you do need to set a strategic direction. So this would not be unique to Metro South. This would not be unique to what we do. But it's about living your plans. It's about having that strategic direction. It's about actually aligning policy levels. It's around having a voice in that policy level. It's about how does it look for your unique area or niche area in health or wherever you work. It might be residential. It might be big acute areas, it could be community services, whatever it might be. They're all absolutely equally important. It's about having a very strong nursing strategic plan that's actually had input from um, everyone. I, I think that uh, when I retire, I think on the, on the speech going out, they say she consulted too much. It's not just about consultation, it's about the ownership. It's about um, valuing that input. Uh, I mean, consultation does incorporate that, but it's not just a communication, say, what do you think? It's about actually getting input and the evidence as well. And then it's about having an operational plan. So it's actually having some really good um, structures around. And the other thing is, it's really, really important, not only about having people at all levels, and it's about your consumers. It's about the using it as a change and integration tool. So, you know, they're not just documents that you pull out at accreditation time or when people come and say, aren't we fantastic? They have to live. Ours, um, if you went onto our website, it's so simple that it's nearly embarrassing, but um, it, people use it. So I think that's, that's what it's about. The other thing, uh, one of our magnet uh, program requirements is to have a professional practice model. And I've just delivered a paper on this. Um, I was just in the States at a nursing conference that had 9,500 nurses there. And most of them were direct care nurses. So it was really exciting. But it was interesting because I, I, at the time when I submitted the abstract, it seemed like a really good idea to talk about professional practice models. And this is to the American people and nurses and associations that actually use this all the time. Bit of a not foreign to um, Australia and to our context of practice, but it's something we don't always formalise into a document. So here am I giving the 101 on how to create and evaluate a professional practice model. So at the time when I put it in, it was a good idea. Maybe last week it wasn't such a good idea, but um, actually it went really well because for me, I, I, I actually shared with the group that I was a bit sceptical about why do you need to have this up? Why do you need to actually go and consult on it? We know what we, we need education. We know what our values are. We know we need to develop um, care delivery models. And we had all of those. But I have to say, it, it's about um, the schema that you have that everybody can recognise um, what those shared uh, values are what the standards of um, expectations are, how we deliver all of these elements. So, you know, it is important that we can now have a conversation from my level to the new grad that came out last week and have the same conversation and shared meaning. So these are sort of the areas that really lead to good transformational leadership. Shared governance, it's not only at, um, this would be one of our divisional structures, um, where we have nursing, at all levels of the organisation have equal partnership and say and accountability for what goes on in the organisation. So that's our division of surgery and um, the chair of nursing and the chair of surgery are joint decision makers. It's not the nurse reporting to the um, medical officer or the chair. But in that too, you've got clinician engagement and shared governance models also talk about um, nurses at all levels having um, input into um, care delivery, policy decision, planning. And so, you know, you do have to look to research. It sounds like a good idea, but we do have a lot of research from a lot of different countries. But the McKinsey, um, McKinsey UK research findings, of course, talks about engagement of clinicians in joint problem solving efforts. Um, and that, you know, the clinical outcomes are 50% higher when greater clinician collaboration. Well, that's one element. But I want to talk about the shared governance model is more than that. It's about direct care nurses um, at all levels of the organisation, all different roles, actually coming together to move, um, whether it be research findings, whether it be, um, uh, you know, 
areas like your pressure injuries, your falls prevention, medication safety, um, mobility, dementia delirium, where we actually have groups of clinicians coming together um, from all levels of the organisation. I'll give you one example. We've got a committee called the Essence of Care Committee. There are 40 uh, individuals, nurses, that come together. The majority of those nurses are actually direct care clinicians, educators, evidence-based practice researchers um, who sit there together to, to make um, not only recommendations to the nursing leadership team, but actually tell us what we need to be doing to take us on a direction where we need to go. And that's actually true shared governance when that is truly valued and you have the structures and the processes in place. So there's also the strength of the interprofessional teams. And I'm sure that um, everybody uh, works this way, but it is so important to make sure that they're valued and, and contributed to and just say, well, it's, you know, you can't say that's not my problem or if there's, say there's an issue. And it's about how we work together every day in our care delivery, but also how we um, undertake research together, how we provide education, and that they become priorities. And um, one example I was only thinking of on my way here was um, occupational violence has become quite, well, it's always been a significant issue, but in fact, you know, it seems to be elevating. And we've actually, we had a couple of nurses come and just say, want to have a look at this and do a piece of research and looked at all the evidence. They're actually looking at an area that hasn't been addressed before. And um, I think there's probably about 25 people, direct care nurses, through to a couple of nurse execs who are really passionate around this, who actually have done a piece of research. They're just doing mining the data at the moment, looking at um, the impact on direct care nurses and what should happen. Now, I know there's a lot of research around, but they've taken a unique perspective. And it's interesting, somebody said to me, you're very brave to want to do this because you mightn't like what you find. Well, we know what we find. We, we see the evidence every day and we need to do something about it. But I was just thinking, um, I don't, or I, I've got a key interest in this area and I pop in every now and then, but it's, these people turn up People come in on their days off. We don't expect that. They are so passionate around what they do. They want to make a difference. And they want to set policy for whether it be Queensland or Australia to look at some different opportunities. So, but in that, they've invited interdisciplinary colleagues. They keep saying, can, you pick, can, can we come on too? You don't make it exclusive. You don't make it nurse-centric. Um, open it up. The other thing is we want to build a culture of accountability, just um, showing how we can use our professional practice model. And um, it's, you link your KPIs with the overarching uh, professional practice model and the unit plans. Um, we're absolutely uh, committed to cultivating professional growth, and that's in terms of education, but also feedback. And I'm very interested in the fact that we actually do 360 degree and peer feedback on every nurse in our organisation. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, this has been for about the last uh, five years, and I was even a little nervous at the beginning. I knew that if we, we looked at certain levels, it would be okay. But, you know, one thinks, oh, this is an interesting piece of territory to go down the, down the pathway of. Um, because you need to make sure that the appropriate education support and training has happened. But also, the most important piece there is having a culture where it's safe to give feedback and it's valued. And that, that value of that feedback is seen as growth and development and opportunity. And I have to say that uh, I, I, I do think I have been absolutely um, amazed that um, we've only had one, because I'm sure there's a few of you there out there thinking, um, uh, have there been any HR type issues or, you know, complaints around it? Um, in the whole time in five years, there was one that uh, perhaps the feedback wasn't given in the way it should have been given, and that was resolved at a very local level. And in fact, great uh, things came out of that and some opportunities to improve even the tool. So, um, and we're actually just in the pro, or we've just finished the um, process of evaluating this peer review. Um, uh, process that we have. Um, the nurse does a self-assessment and then there's a nursing peer review and then that's collated and feedback. So, But you do have to put the supports and the structures, but it's underpinned by a positive practice environment and that, that you know you want to improve. And this is about leadership um, and growth. And we do it um, at all levels, including uh, we all do it and I take it to my performance review as well. Obviously, supporting professional development is... Um, clearly an important 
uh, one of the most important goals and values that we hold. And it was interesting, the, the question before around what had happened in Queensland through reform, which is, what, about two years ago now? Um, one of the decisions that we made as a team and that our exec and our board listened to is um, we absolutely value education and research and there wouldn't be anybody that wouldn't value that. But we actually saw that it was so important to keep our, not only our nursing practice development unit and our educators around, we did not drop one, um, and, but what we did need to do also is build further par um, partnerships and, and value with our university partners who are, who are great. Um, they're an inspiration to us and a great asset to how we do business it's because that is really important that you need an educated and an excited workforce about having opportunities to explore things in a different way, but also to improve practice, continuously improve practice. And not be frightened to drop off things we don't need to be doing anymore that we love to do, um, but what, what is the need of our patient and our, and our profession? How do we grow that body of knowledge for our profession as well? How do we make sure we're interacting and teaching and being with our um, new new profession that's coming through school or, or universities to actually enhance that experience for them. The other thing is measuring nursing contributes to healthcare and patient outcomes through the magnet journey. Um, never get in the way if there's not something out there that you need because the bar gets higher every time you go through a redesignation. And last time we discovered that um, we needed to measure in a, in a very meaningful way and rigorous way our nurse sensitive indicators in a very different way to what had been happening through Queensland. And so when in doubt, just build your own and do what you need to do. And so I think we've gone on a journey in the last five years that has been second to none and it's been hard. And I haven't put any of the results here because that's a whole discussion. But I have to say the team that has led the state, because what we decided is, oh, we need statewide benchmarking data and then we need national. So we've actually gone on this journey and built, um, started to build a database that can be used by many people to measure and learn from peers. And, and uh, it's not, again, about who's the best or who's not. It's about the learnings from who's doing what well. And when you're not doing so well, how do we improve that? Um, so, you know, to me, it is about that brave we, we actually, there, there could have been very poor outcomes from this, but this actually has been a great opportunity for not only um, Metro South, but um, Queensland. The other thing is utilising feedback. Um, we do do the uh, cultural surveys. We've been doing that for multiple years, and I'll show you in a minute. We have have you saved for staff, we, and we have actually, we don't do traditional patient satisfaction feedback. We actually have the patient experience, what they think the experience should be. The richness of the feedback that comes from that actually takes us sometimes on journeys that we wouldn't have even thought possible. Um, and of course, we get very good feedback, but is good uh, good enough? No, uh, we need to really, really improve that. And the other thing we do to make sure we get feedback from staff at all levels is um, we have a lot of, or a number of facilitated clinical summits which have direct care nurses up to the nursing exec so we can really understand what's happening and be guided by clinicians on what should be happening and where we should go and where we should be educating and research and what kind of structures we need. Um, just to empower your staff at every level, um, Magnet Champions, uh, go back to Joy's story and the, the nurses who are here today who led that journey. In um, 2002, we had 60 Magnet Champions. Now, these are ward-based champions who, and from departments who want to be change agents in our organisation. And in 2015, we've got 360 plus, give or take one or two here and there. And we have very good attendance. And, you know, as I said, Essence of Care Committee, we have absolutely determined people turning up uh, on a regular basis. We must celebrate the value of nursing. So um, at Princess Alexandra, we're known for our good times and parties. Uh, we we try to recognise achievement, and um, I'm sure Rosemary Bryant was probably here yesterday, but we had her uh, this year for um, International Nurses Day. And no longer do we actually have a day because we can't fit it in. We have a week. Um, because it's, and actually, <laughs> I, did, I did suggest we didn't fit it all in all that well um, this year. I'm thinking a month and I thought, no, that's, that's probably too much. But it was interesting when I was talking to Rosemary, um, I was just saying, you know, we do need to celebrate. I think sometimes we nearly apologise for what we do. We should be very proud of what we do. And sometimes those small uh, incremental improvements or those small achievements 
up to the wonderful achievements of you know, collaborative research throughout the world or putting a new system in, they're equally as important. They make a difference. And they make a difference to the profession and they make a difference to practice. Now, just going to the culture survey, is that uh, this, um, we use Best Practice Australia, there's multiple um, methodologies you can use and, and providers. But I just want to point out, in 2002, um, Princess Alexandra was, as I said, wasn't in a good space. So as people have put in strategies, and I didn't, I think I came around 2006, people were putting these wonderful strategies and going on this magnet journey that would actually pull the strategies together and gave us a positive framework to use. Um, as you can see, you build your culture up over time and you, um, and you build your culture up so that you can actually, you know, have staff empowered, that, you know, you can actually get great outcomes. But it's also times of significant change or things that go bump in the night um, that you can actually work your way through because the staff will take you on the journey to get through that. And I just want to point out, you'll see um, 2011, and then we just went back a little bit in nursing services to 2013. And I thought, I have to say, that was, does anyone remember the payroll issue in Queensland? <laughs> yeah. I try to forget it, but um, anyway. Uh, do you know what? I really thought, you know, staff were really impacted. Can I say, we only went back a very small way, as you can see. And you buy your culture bank to get staff through and to support them through what needs to happen. You build a culture so you can buy that culture bank when you need to make big change or things happen and things do happen. If anyone's sitting in this room and you've had nothing happen to you in your journey as a, as a nurse leader, please come and tell me because I'm doing something wrong because something always happens. So it's a journey of vision and the interesting thing is, I know I'm talking from a nursing perspective, but in fact the whole organisation has not only taken on the magnet journey, but in the, in the moment we're actually doing our, our um, survey at the moment, our culture survey, and it's the whole of health service. It is all professions. We actually use it as a tool. It can never be used, used as a punitive tool, but it's a wonderful tool to build um, further opportunities. And um, I thought I'd, I, I really thought I could leave nursing and I could retire. Last survey, um, people came back, and I, at my level, we get a message in the bottle, and people tell you what they really think. I mean, you get the survey and the nice objective survey and all the benchmarking, and you think, isn't that lovely? We're, we're above benchmark and we're this and aren't we good? And, uh, but staff then have this message in a bottle, it's anonymous if they want and they can tell you what they think. Well, I thought I had, I, I was just so excited, I, and I, I don't know if this is a good thing or bad thing really to, to admit, but um, I actually, some people wrote action plans for me. Um, they told me how I could improve personally or how the organisation could improve. And they had action plans, I'm going, this is so good. <laughs> And they were really exceptional ideas and it was so... Po when I say positive, there was really things we could do something about. And some people said, can you call me because I've got some other ideas. So they wanted to have a chat. They wanted to talk about it. And some of those ideas have gone forward. So I really thought I'd come of age. Anyway, um, improved patient satisfaction. As I said, we do patient experience. Um, we actually rate above the norm of all the public health sector. And, I th and that's about... Um, staff feeling empowered to make decisions around their patient care and, the, and their journey of their patient through it. So particularly the nursing care, um, we're well above benchmark um, as a public sector norm. So really happy. Now some really hard data for those because we've got a uh, chief exec in the audience here who want to know that there's great return on investment. Um, HR indicators, remember I said about that 26, 28% um, turnover, or it was 12% turnover but the vacancy rate was that. Um, you can see, I haven't named our peers because I thought you might be here, but um, our turnover rate at the moment is 4.55. Now, the thing with this is you do want some turnover rate or otherwise you can't take your new grads and you can't sort of move staff around. But that actually, if you put that in dollar terms, that's a really important um, saving. But more importantly, because it's where it is, you actually have not that turnover of staff, you have longevity of staff, you have excellence in practice, you have expertise growing. So, um, yeah. Um, the other thing is our hospital standardised mortality rate. Uh, we're one of the best in peers. Um, just a CE's perspective, um, we've actually improved a number of our metrics because, you know, we do work in a system. Uh, we actually have to show that we uh, can improve our performance. And as you can see, that um, some of our... Uh, 
you know, long waits and our financials have improved significantly. The other thing is, um, Magnet, the Magnet Recognition Program, with our new um, national safety standards, safety and quality standards, absolutely blend beautifully together because that was one of the issues that people have said to me, but we do national standards and then there's Magnet. Remember that the Magnet Recognition Program and the framework we use, and I prefer to call it the framework we use, is about professional nursing practice. Um, an accreditation system is quite different. Magnet Recognition Program is a credential of high standard, but very complimentary. You don't have to do double the work. The other thing is we have received, um, and thanks to the people not only in this room, but um, I have to acknowledge all the direct care nurses and all the nurses at Princess Alexandra Hospital. And not only at that hospital, our integrated nursing service across Metro South Health is the most supportive and um, keeps us incredibly uh, honest and profiled and also excited about the um, changes to our practice and the improvements we can make. So we're very proud of that. And the other thing is transformation is about transformational leaders at all level. Um, shared governance at all levels, having a professional practice model, um, and I know that a lot of uh, my colleagues are actually doing that at the moment. Courage and um, really to stretch the norms and have stretch stretch objectives. I don't believe any of your CEs or any of your nursing executive would see that as a bad thing. It's about how you, how you go about doing it. We all love a stretch. We all like to improve. We all like to try different things. The other thing is nurses do need to be strategically placed. One of the areas that was a concern through some of our reform and changes, not only in Queensland, is that nursing may not have had a voice at appropriate levels of the organisation. And we're now seeing some of the effects of that. I have to say, our, um, that did not happen in our health service, but you actually do see a tangible effect. And I think that um, Alan sort of spoke to that very, very well before. Also, leadership is not always about structure. And in fact, I think that's, you know, you can get caught if you think about it as structure. It is about your influence. It is about your credibility. It's also about your passion. But it's also about being open to feedback and constructive criticism. Trust me, I'm an expert at that. Um, lots of people give me lots of feedback. Um, and we have to truly believe we can make a difference. It's not about a tick and a flick. It's not around just thinking, oh, this looks good for the board or it looks good for you know, our academic partners or it looks, it has to be authentic, it has to have meaning and we truly have to have that energy and passion around making a difference. And I just want to thank you all for being the great nurse leaders that you are. I, I absolutely um, have enjoyed um, talking in, with you today, but I also enjoy and get inspired by all the clinicians I work with every day and all my colleagues here today. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Veronica. You can stay there for a moment, Veronica. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, listen, I know we're under the whip time-wise, but there is one question that seems to be resonating with everybody in here uh, uh, with over 20 uh, votes on it, and that is, how can you inspire people to strive to be better when they come to work with an attitude of it's just a means to an end? H how, how can you light a fire under them? How can you rekindle, obviously, what would have been a passion at some point? Um, I think it's actually understanding why it's not a passion for them anymore and I think we have to be respectful of that because if we learn of people's journey, journeys, um, often there is, um, they've been disappointed by their leaders or their peers, uh, they might have felt disempowered um, and it is rare and I've been around a long, I'm very recycled, I've been around a long time, um, it is rare, you do get the odd person who just doesn't want to be there, do you know what? I loved what Alan said. You know, you have to be brave. There are policies, there are ways you can support people to other opportunities. It may not be in nursing. And so, you know what, that's okay because they're not good for the team, they're not good for the patient. It's spending the time. It's actually, passion will breed passion as well, but, but people need to question that passion. You can be very excited and very passionate about a lot of things, but unless there's some evidence behind it, there's some vision and there's some authenticity, it won't mean a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Veronica Casey. Thanks.